Hello everyone, this is Mr. Geocon. I apologize for not posting for a while. I had a lot on my plate this past November, so I wasn't able to get done with all the videos I wanted to do before the end of 2020. I am in the process of recording the reaction video to Louis Levi on classical liberalism and politics in gaming, so you can expect to see that soon. But today, I wanted to make a video response to an old friend of mine. This is more of a fun video that I hope will be the start of a friendly dialogue between two people who hold a lot of our beliefs in common. So with that, let's get on to it. About three years ago now, my friend Christopher Lansdowne released a video entitled There Is No Such Thing As Canon In Fiction. In that video, he discusses why he believes there is no such thing as canon in fictional works. Now, for a while, this video convinced me of his argument, and I found it appealing for many reasons. I, like Christopher, was not a fan of the Star Wars movies coming out at the time. In addition, I had soured on the concept of intellectual property, and Christopher's arguments against canon seemed to follow from a rejection of intellectual property rights. These were strong reasons to be in favor of his argument. However, while the conclusion of his argument was appealing to me, and the argument itself was interesting, I soon realized that the premises of the argument were quite weak. In fact, they were rather bad. The weaknesses of the arguments were, weren't apparent at first because Christopher did not offer a counter-argument. But as a good Christian, I hope to provide him with these arguments in the spirit of charity. Now, before we can speak of whether there is such a thing as canon, we must first establish what a canon is. In this context, the best definition of canon is, quote, a sanctioned or accepted group or body of related works, unquote. The word canon comes from the Greek kanon, meaning a straight bar or rod. Kanon was often used metaphorically for any rule or standard, and it is from this metaphor that the word canon derives its definition, as could be seen in the Greek translations of the New Testament. Simply put, to say that there exists a canon in fiction is to say that there is some rule that the fictional works follow. Whenever we say a work is a part of the same canon as in the other work, we mean to say that the second work's story treats the first work's story as if it happened within the same universe. Two works within the same canon have continuity between one another. So, for example, the original Star Wars trilogy is in the same canon as the prequel trilogy. The prequel trilogy treats the original as if it will happen in the future. Characters and plot points extend from one to the other. It is apparent to most people, just from an explanation of the phenomenon, that canon exists. This is because, to the layman, the plain text should be enough to understand the meaning of that text. Therefore, if the plain reading of Star Wars Episode Two treats Episode One as if it had happened, then they are part of the same canon. Now, this layman understanding is okay so far as it goes. However, different people can come up with different interpretations of the same text. If you doubt this, then take a look at the thousands of different Protestant denominations that claim to follow the plain text of the Bible. Ancient philosophers like St. Augustine, as well as modern analytic philosophers like W.V.O. Quine and Saul Kripke, have argued that no physical phenomenon or set of physical phenomena contain inherent meaning. If I were to point to a rabbit and yell out, GAVAGAI! No onlooker would be able to tell what I mean by that. The word gavagai could be referring to rabbits, to black rabbits, to the act of pointing, the act of pointing to black rabbits, or any number of other things. 
The consequence of this is that no set of utterances, behavior, or other semantic phenomena is inherently meaningful. Rather, these signs derive their meaning from the intentional actions of the intellect directing them. Naturally, this places the author in a position of power when it comes to the correct interpretation of his works. After all, who best to understand what a given text means than the one who wrote it himself? Therefore, the author of the text determines its meaning because without knowing the author's intentions, we cannot know the meaning of the text. This epistemological fact places the author as the final arbiter of what he means by a certain text. His intentions at the time he was writing determine what the very words within the, a story mean. If this is not the case, if we insist that the author's intentions are irrelevant, then we are left with ambiguity. In this case, anyone can decide what the text means. To realize how absurd this is, imagine if we treated all of language like this, not just the written word. Communication would become impossible because any utterance we made could be taken to have multiple definitions. Therefore, the author's intentions must be the deciding factor in knowing the meaning of a given text. So, if the author intended for a given text to be read as part of a canon, then it must be part of that canon. As with all things, there are caveats. Any communicator may make mistakes, or say more than he intended, or not realize the full implications of what he did say. But these points do not detract from the fact that language is reliant on intentionality to have meaning. So long as this is true, the intentions of the author determine it the canonicity of the work. That is the first argument for the existence of canon, the argument from inherent semantic indeterminacy. The other argument I'll make to prove the existence of canon is the argument from author's rights. This is a term related to copyright, though it slightly differs in its emphasis. Whereas copyright in the Anglo-American context arose from the need to correct a market failure, the concept originated in France as a series of privileges granted by the crown, was expanded to all citizens in the French Revolution, and then exported to the rest of the continent during and following the Napoleonic Wars. Today, authors' rights are an acknowledged part of European law. The logic of authors' rights harkens back to the ancient notion that a creator owns the right to dispose of his creation as he so chooses. This notion was implicit within Roman law and a part of the natural law. This understanding of property seems obviously intuitive to us Christians. After all, part of the logic of Christianity is that God has dominion over all of creation as its creator. This is the moral basis of property rights in law. If we accept that the author creates the concept of the written work, and not just the mere copy, then author's rights follow. Now, how does this relate to canon in fiction? Well, the way canon works is that the author decides whether or not a given work is canon to his earlier works by fiat. For example, the Star Wars Expanded Universe was considered part of the same canon as the films up until 2014, when Lucasfilm decided it wasn't, outside of a couple of exceptions like the Clone Wars cartoon. In short, whether one work is part of the same canon as another depends primarily on presentation. Now, if there is such a thing as author's rights, then the author has complete control over the work, including the ability to control its presentation and integrity. Deciding whether or not a work is in the same canon as another is an author's right by virtue of his dominion over his text. Now, if we compare these arguments for the existence of canon in fiction to Christopher's, it becomes apparent that his arguments by themselves cannot address mine. For example, 
he claims that canon in fiction cannot exist because it is impossible for authors to be consistent in their continuity. But the inability of men to establish a perfect canon is not a reason to discard canon. Remember, a canon is a rule or standard, so we should expect us imperfect humans to fail in trying to follow those rules. Christopher would never have us disregard human laws because criminals exist, nor the rules of grammar because bad writers exist. Rules are important because they create standards for us to follow. Additionally, the author has a moral right to declare this or that work part of the same canon, regardless of any continuity errors that may occur. Another argument he makes, similar to the first, is that the authors of multiple works cannot possibly all be considered part of the same canon because their writing styles are too different. But this is wrong for two reasons. First, the author of the text determines its meaning. If the author of a work intended for his text to be part of the same canon as another's text, then whether or not their writing styles match is irrelevant. The correct interpretation of that particular work must involve recognizing that the author considered that work part of the same canon as another work. To see how this works, imagine a canon as a house that we are building, and the authors are its builders. There may be multiple builders working on that same building, but even though the builders may have different methods, temperaments, and life experiences, their actions are aimed at the same goal, namely the completion of the building. Granted, the builders may not be in harmony with one another, and this may result in slipshod construction, but a bad building is still a building. In much the same way, different authors can write different stories of completely different styles and still be considered within the same canon, even if there are continuity errors. Additionally, each author has dominion over his text. If multiple authors decide to present their texts as being different parts of the same canon, they have the right to do so. Now, this gets into fuzzy territory when one author presents his works as being part of the same canon as another author's work without that other author's permission. However, we do have a name for such works. Fan fiction. Another point that Christopher makes in his video is that people change over time. So works by the same author, written at different points in time, might as well have been written by different people. Therefore, they cannot be considered part of the same canon for the same reason that works from different authors cannot be. Leaving aside the fact that different authors can create works within the same canon, this argument is even weaker since it denies identity over time. Granted, a person can change over time so much that they may appear to be a different person. The process by which an 8-year-old child becomes a 28-year-old adult involves many bodily and psychological changes. Yet, there is an abiding self that remains. The same particular instantiation of the human essence persists over time. The 28-year-old adult existed in the eight-year-old child potentially. To deny this is to say that an acorn is not an oak tree, or a tadpole is not a frog. Needless to say, it's a radical position that he needs to give a better argument towards. Suffice to say, if the author minus ten years is the same person as the author today, that author has dominion over all of his texts, so he may present them as being part of the same canon as he wishes. Another argument Christopher makes is that the way modern canon works is akin to the situation of Greek myths in ancient Greece. Between the different ancient Greek city-states, different versions of the same stories would be told in different regions. One story might depict Zeus one way, another might depict him another way. Though this may share some relation, they are not in continuity with each other and in fact blatantly contradicted each other at times. He likens all of modern media to this, pointing to the loose relationship between different Spider-Man comics and television series had with one another. But Christopher's analogy 
overlooks the differences between modern fiction and ancient mythology. The differences between stories today and stories in the ancient world was each culture's conception of story creation. The concept of the author as an individual who creates original stories and, by creating them, owns them, did not exist back then. This is something I learned reading the book Owning Culture by Kimbrew McLeod. I highly recommend it. Before modernity, two different ideas of what an author was existed. The first was the author as a craftsman, someone who adhered to a body of rules and who manipulated traditional materials in a way that satisfied his audience. The second was the author as an inspired individual, someone who is an instrument of a higher power, like a muse or even God. During Renaissance-era Europe, these two ideas were combined together so that the author was mostly a craftsman, but would occasionally receive some divine inspiration to achieve something higher with his text. The modern-day concept of the author began with thinkers like Thomas Hobbes, as well as the 18th century Enlightenment thinkers. They departed from the Renaissance era's depiction of authorship in two ways. First, they minimized or discarded the element of craftsmanship in favor of the element of inspiration. And second, they internalized the source of that inspiration so that the author himself was the source of the idea rather than some supernatural entity. It was through this process that the idea of authors owning their works entered the public consciousness and formed the basis for the idea of authors' rights. Since authors now owned their work, they could more easily establish canons in fiction. Finally, Christopher argues that if there was no such thing as canon, then things would be easier for all of us. But pretending something isn't real doesn't make it less real. Canon exists regardless of our wishes. Our choice to ignore something doesn't make the thing stop existing. At the same time, I get his point. We shouldn't get upset over the existence of crappy Star Wars movies. But you don't need to deny reality to recognize that getting emotionally invested in a soulless corporate IP isn't going to make you happy. In conclusion, there are two reasons why you should accept the existence of canon in fiction. First, if you don't understand the intentions of the author, you cannot understand the story. If the author intended for his story to be part of a canon, and you dismiss the very concept of canon, you may not be able to fully understand the story. For example, an increasing number of authors today are nerds writing for other nerds. Therefore, they are a great deal more conscious of things like continuity and fandoms. To dismiss the concept of fictional canons like Christopher does is a disservice to their work. He'd be making the same mistake as atheists who treat the Bible like a science textbook. Second, it is the author's right to present his work however he likes. If he wants to present one of his works as being part of the same canon as another work, then so be it. It's his work after all. I mean, you can say, oh, this work isn't part of canon, but then you'd be entering into the realm of fan fiction. I hope to hear your response, Christopher, and I extend an invitation for you to come onto my channel and have a discussion. I'd like to hear your opinions on things. And to all my dear listeners, if you like this video, then like, share, comment, and subscribe. Have a happy Advent.